Malawi has enjoyed peace and political stability since its independence in 1964. But the landlocked nation is heavily dependent on foreign aid and food imports, and food scarcity has become a pressing issue. According to the World Food Programme, some 5.4 million Malawians, that's 33% of the population, don't have enough to eat. The COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine have made things worse for the small country and its people. Facing rising inflation, hundreds of people have been protesting against the government of President Lazarus Chikwera, who took office in 2020, promising an ambitious economic agenda. At least 70 protesters have been detained, raising questions about the president's commitment to democratic freedoms. Chikwera's government has ordered an investigation against former president Peter Mutarika in connection with the murder of an albino man in 2018. People with albinism in the region are often a target of human rights abuses, stigmatization and discrimination. And while President Chikwera says human rights must be guaranteed to all Malawians, police detained investigative journalist Gregory Gondwe, who said he was pressured to reveal his sources on a government corruption story. With his term in office ending in 2025, will Malawians see the country and economy their leader promised to deliver during his presidential campaign? The president of Malawi, Lazarus Chikwera, talks to Al Jazeera. Lazarus Chikwera, president of Malawi, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. I want to start with a pressing issue for your administration and for many Malawians, the global food crisis. Now, we know that Malawi is a very heavy net food importer. In 2018, something like 17% of that came from Russia, I believe, including the majority of your wheat. Now, since the start of the war in Ukraine, the price of a bag of flour, I believe, has risen by 42%. And we've also seen floods, late rains. How worried are you about your country going hungry, sir? You know, these are real uh, issues you raise. Uh, the war has not helped because prices of food, fuel and fertilizers have spiked. And uh, you're right that um, our consumption, particularly of uh, wheat-related uh, foodstuffs, uh, is uh, uh, being affected negatively. We pray for peace and we pray for the resolution of these things. However, what we are doing currently is to diversify and have uh, other food systems that can uh, enter into the equation so Malawians uh, can still uh, survive and thrive this period uh, despite the pain that we all experience as a result of the shortage. I'm curious about what you mean by diversify, because I see the World Food Programme says something like a third of your people are currently facing moderate to severe chronic food insecurity. I, I know you removed VAT on cooking oil and a number of other products earlier this year. Clearly, that isn't enough. So what are your other plans to tackle food prices? We did uh, remove VAT and some of the imported uh, materials that are needed desperately. We did have a shortage in terms of maize production, uh, even though uh, what we were able to uh, produce uh, would still be on average uh, higher than the last five years. But we are encouraging the production of cassava, uh, potato, and others in order to supplement that which cannot be imported. And so our biggest uh, challenge right now is to be sure that uh, even in places where there were floods because of Cyclone Anna and Gombe and uh, drought because the rains came late, uh, we should have sufficient supply of maize to cover everyone. And we believe that um, uh, that is doable. Of course, but amidst all of this, we've seen inflation skyrocket. The kwacha has been devaluing, and there's also a foreign exchange issue around that. Yes, the devaluation of the kwacha was a necessary evil, and um, uh, I think that realignment has helped a lot. 
uh, free up some uh, forex so that we're able to uh, import what is necessary. Uh, our continued discussions with the IMF are giving us prospects of our hope uh, that uh, we could have uh, a program with them, but the responsibility would still be on us uh, to produce, add value to what we produce, and then export. You mentioned the IMF. I understand that they've said they will, well, they will give aid to Malawi as long as the massive public debt issue is dealt with. I see you've also introduced austerity measures, but it's also hitting the public health sector. So now there are fewer ambulances. They're not allowed to collect the dead. Patients in hospital are only getting one meal a day. I mean, that's really quite the trade-off, quite the sacrifice. Uh, our discussions with the IMF uh, uh, hinge on, for example, how to manage our debt uh, because um, it's becoming uh, something that causes distress. And so we believe that our discussions are bearing fruit because uh, we had entered into certain uh, debts, uh, some of which we inherited at very expensive rates. but. Uh, we believe that this too can be managed. You say that you've been met with understanding, but there has also been a lot of disillusionment and anger. You ran on a campaign that got you elected to produce one million jobs. Now, in February, this February, you told Parliament you'd created 997,423 jobs in the last year. That's a very specific number. The year before, though, some 600,000 jobs were lost. And I know that your former Labour Minister expected 1.5 million job losses due to the pandemic. So let me ask you then, sir, how many jobs have you actually created since the start of your term? And are you satisfied with that? When you're talking about uh, jobs, we're talking about sources of income that could give someone a livelihood. And uh, because of the pandemic, two-year uh, pandemic, yes, jobs were lost and many companies were closed. Others are just trying to revive. We have also tried to do the best we can to encourage construction industry infrastructure across the country to uh, uh, make sure that uh, people uh, get jobs. Our National Economic Empowerment Fund uh, has disbursed the 37.2 billion kwacha uh, to various groups in order for them to uh, create such jobs. 162,000 of such groups uh, have been helped across the country. We are just trying the best we can within the circumstance. That, and and uh, you are right that uh, the pain is being felt by everyone. But we want to be sure, even though the whole world is, is, is sharing in these uh, issues, we want to be sure that we can mitigate the Malawian situation and uh, be sure that uh, people uh, will go on. Well, it seems, sir, that there are many people who don't believe that your administration has been very successful at this mitigation, so to speak. There have obviously been anti-government protests that we've seen, several rounds of them, April last year, November last year, and, and also just in the last few weeks. So in your mind then, who are the people who are on the streets who are marching and what do they want? Do they have a valid complaint? You know, it is a constitutional right uh, for people to protest and to do it peacefully and to do it safely. And so uh, if you also consider the hundreds and thousands of those that we have been able to help through social cash transfers across the country, affecting over 4 million people. And uh, these other issues and programs that I just mentioned about uh, empowerment, uh, that is not an answer for everyone. And so we realize that um, this is not uh, supply the jobs that are needed for everybody. And so they are protesting and they have a right to do that. But we are also doing something that if you ask the millions that have been helped, they would also tell a story that sometimes is not being told when the emphasis is just on those who protest. 
Dr. Chiquera, you talk about the constitutional right to protest, but in this latest round, something like at least 70 people were arrested during these protests, and that does also include human rights activists. I believe an injunction was also issued to try to stop the protests from taking place. That doesn't give a very good impression of Malawi's commitment to democratic freedoms. Well, you have to understand when I said people have a right to protest peacefully, uh, you will notice that there have been hundreds of people that were not even arrested. And so in this particular case you refer to, uh, there was a case where people began looting, breaking into shops, and the police have even recovered some of those stolen items and returning them to the shop owners. This is definitely criminal, but it has nothing to do with whether people should be able to protest or not. In fact, other companies and other groups of people continue to protest regarding several issues that they are not happy about. This is a particular case where people are answering charges of criminality. Uh, but sir, a number of human rights activists were also arrested. Uh, will you make a commitment then that if people were not participating in criminal activity, they will be released? They will be released. My commitment has never wavered. Well, let me ask you then about other democratic freedoms, like press freedom. Uh, Malawi, I see, has been falling in the rankings for media freedom. An investigative journalist was detained back in April, interrogated while working on a story specifically about government corruption, I believe. A nurse was recently arrested for insulting you, sir, on WhatsApp. Another man was arrested as well for insulting the Minister of Labor. Now, earlier this month, you yourself said that no journalist is in jail for publishing negative stories about the government, nor for insulting the president. Do you still hold that to be true? I still do. You must understand when such things happen and there have been one or two cases, we have nipped that in the bud precisely because we do not want people to feel like uh, uh, they have no freedom to express themselves, the Constitution is pretty clear on that. And so as far as I'm concerned, I have uh, stated not once, but many times that I will not have journalists harassed or imprisoned. So those people have been released and you as the president do believe that people can publicly insult you? Oh, well, they are doing that daily. <laughs> well, so one of the things that people have been criticizing you for has been allegations of corruption. Now. Your former labor minister, lands minister, energy minister are all being investigated, not to mention your vice president. I see in January the Catholic Archbishop and several bishops in Malawi, along with civil society groups, they, they released a statement that said the cancer of corruption, sadly now embedded in Malawi, is largely responsible for keeping the country very poor and underdeveloped. You sacked your entire cabinet just a few days later. How confident are you that your new cabinet is entirely clean. Well, you know, even as we speak, there is uh, a national conference uh, on resetting our moral uh, tone as a nation. And I want everyone to know that we do have that political will, but we must address such issues across board. And we must have all stakeholders uh, participate and this is the conversation that is currently taking place. But it goes beyond a conversation, doesn't it? It goes into systems and implementation of those systems. So let me ask you then, Mr. President, how is your new cabinet vetted? The cabinet is doing fine. I, I can tell you that every time that we have issues raised, we know that there are institutions that are mandated to investigate the same. You have been witness to the actions that I have taken. And uh, we were even this morning briefed on what has been done, not just talking, but the talking still needs to happen because everyone must participate and then agree on a way forward. Let me rephrase my question then, Mr. President. What's different this time round with your cabinet? What will stop corruption from happening now? Everyone is scared. They can't, they can't just will-nilly uh, do whatever they would want. That is the message that is there. Even at Capitol Hill, 
you must understand that uh, uh, even the studies will show you that much of the corruption, as much as uh, politicians will be uh, central to it because of the political will that's needed, uh, a lot of public sector, private sector collusion has been there. And this is what we are addressing currently. Well, sir, you yourself have been accused of nepotism. I know you've taken it very personally when your daughter Violet's positions were questioned. I believe she now holds a position at the Malawi Embassy in London. Your son-in-law, Sean Campondeni, is your executive assistant, the State House Director of Communications. Now, obviously, public perception, as you've alluded to, is hugely important. So what would you say to those who believe that you're just perpetuating the behavior that you yourself have, has criticized? You must understand that a person like Sean Campondin, for example, has been with me from 2013. And uh, nobody said anything at that time. And so he is the one that works with me. But even those that have raised that question have come to realize that this is not really the issue because uh, we can show you that there are so many others that are qualified, that have been deployed in various ministries and departments and agencies of this government to the end that you cannot take one example and then blow it like you sure, say. I, I, I'm not trying to case. blow anything out of proportion, sir, but I'm just talking about public perception here. And I think that that's a fair question to ask because other people have raised it as well. And it's about how people view you and how yes. they view your government. And I know that you've very recently assured Malawians that you'll achieve your vision for your plans, for your development of the country, that the desire by prophets of doom to see you fail will not succeed. So let me ask you, in terms of perception and, and the way that you're trying to communicate with your electorate, who are these prophets of doom? Anyone who says Malawi cannot rise, anyone who says nothing works, anyone who says that... Uh, uh, this country will never develop. That's who I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who, instead of encouraging others to work like we are wanting to work and getting Malawians united, and it is not a specific name. I'm just talking about the attitude that needs to change in order for Malawi to truly rise. Well, one of the other critics, uh, very vocal critics of your administration is former President Peter Mujerika after that 2019 election debacle. What is your relationship like now? I, I see that your government has also recently requested that he be investigated in connection with a murder of an albino man. Those matters uh, came out of court hearings and court judgments and so forth. Uh, but my relationship with the former president, as well as other former presidents, is cordial. And so presumably you'll watch that case of the albino murder take place and you encourage a full investigation to take place? I will not force anyone to do anything. I will just let uh, those who uh, see fit. Because me, I want uh, people with urbanism uh, protected. I want them to live freely and work freely, roam freely. In this country, this is their land. I want everyone to be able to feel safe that as Malawians, uh, we can do that. Well, sir, I'd like to ask you about another case of interest that's come up recently as well. A Chinese man who is now being charged for producing racist videos, getting Malawian children to say derogatory things about themselves in Chinese. Can I ask you personally what went through your mind when you saw those reports, especially given how involved China is in Malawi? Uh, I wasn't happy about the footages that I saw uh, when this thing was revealed, uh, but uh, the appeal is to everyone. Uh, let's not abuse others. Uh, for whatever reason. Let us live as humanity, one family. Uh, sir, your country obviously has a very robust relationship with Beijing. China even built your parliament house. And I see you've just launched a national data center that will host all government-wide systems. That's built in coordination with the Chinese government. I believe they've even commissioned Huawei to run it. Now, at Malawi's Independence Day celebrations this year, you spoke about the dangers of foreign exploitation. And I quote, 
Malawi could choose between being a puppet or pawn in the race between the East and the West, or rather becoming a shining example in the global South. How do you feel that race between East and West is playing out in Africa? Well, uh, some of these geopolitical uh, questions uh, are handled as diplomatically as uh, we can. Malawi, for example, and Africa uh, needs to have relations with all of the nations. And someone should not be able to say, don't talk to so-and-so if they are not their friend, because we should be able to talk to everyone because we have so decided. Let me ask you an undiplomatic question then, Mr. President. Um, given that tensions are rising between the East and the West, if forced to choose, who would you choose? We do not want to be uh, put in a position where you, you're told uh, you choose either this one or that. Both, not either or, but both and. Well, then you also spoke about Malawi becoming a shining example for the Global South. And, and obviously one of the big challenges that the Global South is currently facing is climate change. What are you doing in terms of trying to adapt to this changing world? And, and do you actually have what you need to do it? We may not have all we need to do it, but whatever we have, we are wanting to use it to do it. We have embarked on uh, uh, projects, for example, in energy, where many grids across the country are being encouraged apart from the main grid in order for us to have the necessary power for agro-processing uh, industries and for other industries, because that is uh, number one need in the country. But sir, all of this requires resources and resources requires the rest of the world to be involved, especially when we're talking about a country like Malawi that's heavily dependent on aid. So let me ask you, I know you've previously spoken about wanting Africa to have a, a permanent seat at the UN Security Council. How realistic do you think that is and, and how much would that change things? It, it is a realistic request because uh, the time has uh, changed since the uh, UN uh, you know, was birthed out of the League of Nations, uh, most African countries were not even independent at that time. Now, you're talking about uh, 1.3 billion people on the continent and no permanent seat uh, at the UN. Uh, that is a travesty uh, of justice. I want to turn to the region as well, because you are currently the chair of the Southern African Development Community, or, or SADC, and you are handing power over next month, I believe. Now, in the time that you've been in that position, you've had to deal with the ongoing insurgency in Mozambique, unrest in Iswatini, and I know elections in Zimbabwe are just around the corner. Where do you see the greatest ongoing regional threats? Yes, next month I'll be handing over the chairship uh, to DRC, uh, President Chitsakedi. But I can assure you that even with uh, the uh, issues that bedeviled us in Mozambique, in Cabo Delgado, uh, we are handling this as a region uh, together uh, with the cooperation uh, multilaterally uh, that also Mozambique has a right bilaterally to have with others. And so we will continue to do that even in DRC and other parts uh, of Southern Africa because we realize that uh, uh, peace is def definitely needed in order for us to realize the integration agenda that we have uh, for transformation and industrialization. Well, speaking of transformation, sir, you often speak about a new Malawi rising. Your current term ends in 2025. Given the broad challenges that you're facing now as a country and within the context of, of the, great, the greater global challenges that the world faces, are you confident that we'll see the dawn of a, a new Malawi before then? I'm more than confident. I can tell you that there are things that this country has and some of which things are actually being uh, uh, discovered uh, right now. So the prospects are uh, huge. We, uh, Sovereign Metals just announced that uh, uh, they have discovered in Malawi the biggest uh, deposits of rutile anywhere 
in the world. And we do have others, uh, minerals across the country, apart from what we are trying to do in agriculture in order to have it commercialized and mechanized. Uh, and um, the agro-processing factories that we want to have, we do believe that this country has a prospect to truly be on a trajectory of real development. And um, I have no doubts about it. Lazarus Chiquera, President of Malawi, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. You're welcome.